Sounds like a good fit. Well, glad you all could make it tonight. I'm excited for, uh, for tonight's call. Um, so um, we've covered a ton of topics. Jeff and I were talking about it earlier today. And, um, you know, we're always trying to find new content and new ways to help everyone sell, sell more real estate and become better agents and, and be educated. Um, our um, class today was a good example. It wasn't about real estate. It was about helping us be better, better uh, you know, uh, facilitators of, of knowledge for our clients and our friends as well with our uh, class today, Tuesday at noon. So um, we're talking today kind of about um, sometimes we need to, we have new agents come on and we have agents that maybe didn't see the classes in the, in the, in the past. So we thought it'd be a really good time to circle back to something we did, we did probably five or six months ago, I think quite a while ago. And that's, really what to do once we have a buyer that's ready to roll on a property. So kind of that shopping is over and they want to find it. They, they identified the house that they want to purchase. What's the next step? And a lot of times with, uh, with the agents that, that I'm helping out, that's kind of the, the phone call that I get a lot is like it's seven 30 at night and they just went out and looked at, six homes and their buyer said, Hey, I'm ready. I love this house. I want to put an offer in. And then I get the call, Eric, what do I do? <laughs> so, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny cause we we go through a lot of trainings. We go through real estate school. And then when it comes right down to it, um, it's almost like, it's almost like your brain freezes sometimes, at least mine does sometimes. Okay. What, what, what do I do? I'll make sure I do hit all the steps and everything. So I thought we kind of do um, a little bit, uh, more of a, not a, I wouldn't say basic class, but kind of, kind of an in-depth um, offer class on kind of the steps that I go through and, and uh, Jeff goes through uh, when we're looking to put an offer in on a property. And um, my voice is a little crackly tonight. Apologize. I, I uh, just had a, had a cold last week, nothing serious, but i um, just trying to recover. So if my voice disappears, Jeff, you take over. <laughs> but um, anyway, so um, first off, um, just to kind of back up just a little bit on what we do before we have, we're ready to put that offer in, is obviously some very important steps prior to that. Before you go shopping with a client, we need to know what they're qualified for, what type of loan they're going to have what their financial situation is. And that's not our job to do that. It's our job to get them in front of the right person that can help them. You know, having the right lender, uh, knowing what their situation is so they know what they can qualify for. Um, I, I did it at the beginning of my career, really frustrating when you go out and you start looking and somebody says, I really wanna see this house and I'm so excited about it and you go show it to them and they love it and then you find out they don't qualify for 400,000. They only qualify for 330. <laughs> and now we're shopping at 330 when they, when they fell in love with a house that was 400. We don't want to put ourselves through that or our clients. Um, so qualify, get them in front of a lender, find out what they qualify and, and um, get that process started first. Hey, Eric, let me add to that. Uh, the, another reason why that's so important not just to know what their price range is so you're showing them the right homes right um but this market's so competitive um sometimes people want to be more aggressive so you have to know what their maximum is especially in the price range eric was just talking about if they're under four hundred thousand dollars they've got a lot of buyers that want that house and what happens with our buyers right they're doing searches if they're looking say between let's just say between three and 400, they're going to like a $400,000 house a lot better than a $300,000 house. So what happens in that entry level price point, at least in our market, they're looking right at their maximum. They're looking like um, if they're qualified for 400, they're looking at those that are listed at 395, 399 and 400, right? A lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times. And so it's super, super important to know what their maximum is and what their payment is. And then um, also the correlation between um, what that's going to do to their payment if there's an HOA fee. So a lot of preliminary work there it saves a lot of time. I'm glad you started with that because not only just knowing that they are qualified, period, but 
the numbers and what they can afford and um, that max, what that maximum payment is going to be and what that looks like is super important in this market. And two, we always want to do what's best for our clients um, and what's best for their situation. What if we get them qualified and they're qualified up to 400, but that monthly payment at 400 is more than what they're really comfortable with. So maybe we'll be shopping at a maximum of 360 because they don't want to go over that price, that monthly price range. So, you know, just because you can qualify for a max amount, that doesn't mean that's what you should purchase as a buyer. So that's something to keep in, in mind as well. So you got to have those numbers in place. Um, another thing too, that's really, really important is we don't control what our buyer's situation is in when we're writing an offer. So in a perfect world, we would love it if all of our buyers were cash buyers and can close in a week. And uh, they're just going to be number one on the list of whatever offer <laughs> offers that a listing agent comes in. They're going to say, wow, we want this guy to buy our house. So we have to work with um, all sorts of buyers from, from cash buyers ready to close right away all the way to, um, you know, VA buyers that are putting zero down um, or zero down programs and they need closing costs to, to get a house. So it's a wide spectrum of buyers that we're working with. So it's important that when we write the offer and we help them that we're giving them the best possible chance to get the home that they, they really want. And a lot of that comes down to how we construct an offer and what we do. So before we get into kind of writing the offer and kind of and looking at um, you know, different forms that we use, um, I wanted to show you just an example from a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Uh, let's see, can I share my screen, Jeff? Yeah, it should be open. Okay. Let's see. Can you guys see a letter in front of you? Yep. So this is a letter, uh, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but this is a letter that I had my buyer uh, construct to write to um, a potential uh, seller. And when I write, when I have them write the offer, I say just, address it to whoever we're going to write the offer in. I have them construct it before we even start looking at houses and I have them just kind of tell their story. And some buyers are more comfortable with this than others. But when you're selling a house, um, you're emotionally and in, kind of involved with your home. You've put a lot into your house. You care about your house and you really are really interested in the type of people that are moving into your home. So, I like to, I guess, say, use that to my advantage in a way. Um, but I want them to know, I want that seller to know who my buyers are and, you know, how, you know, what they're all about. And so the seller kind of knows what kind of family is moving into their house. So I have them construct this and write it up. I don't coach them much. I just want to, I want to see what they come up with. And then I'll have them just to include a photo of their family. And I'll attach it to whatever offer we're going to put in on the house. And I request that the listing agent please share with the seller uh, when they present the offer so they know who we are. And this really, really makes a difference in a market where there might be multiple offers and, and, and um, you know, different people offering on the house. And I got to tell you, I've, Jeff, I've been doing this since 2003. In 2003, every agent called every agent and they said, hey, tell me about your house. Tell me, tell me what your seller, you know, is interested in. We're looking at maybe putting an offer in, um, you know, what kind of offer would you like to have constructed or what's important to the seller? But through time with technology, it's amazing. We've gone from calling people to emailing people to texting agents to you know what, I'm just going to write an offer and send it over. So it's amazing yeah. when, you, when you have a listing and you just receive an offer. You're like, I don't even remember somebody, I didn't even remember this agent scheduling an appointment to look at my listing. And I just got an offer. And all it is is a, a listing agent and a buyer's name. And that's all I know. So get in the habit of when you write an offer, call the agent that has the house before you write that offer and say, What's important to your seller? Is it a, is it a quick close? 
Um, is it a simple transaction? Are, where are they moving to? Um, do they have a place already to go? Do they need a little bit more time or are they in a hurry? All of those things can help you construct an offer. And even if it doesn't change your offer in any way, um, it lets the other listing agent know that you care about that, that situation on the, on the seller side. And it really gives you a leg up because agents want to work with agents that, that know what they're doing for one, but also um, care about all parties involved. So, uh, and it's just not something that's done as much as it used to be um, where agents are actually talking to each other about the situations before those offers come in. Eric, that's a good distinction. I mean, you just gave two opposite examples, right? I mean, I'll get an email just like you have before and it'll in the subject line, it'll say offer on such and such address. And then the body of the email says, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so what I like about the phone calls and I do that every single time and, and, and that's, you know, backing up just a little bit, that's the conversation with our buyer when we're leaving that house or the last house we're showing them that day. And they say, you know what? I really like that second one we want to do want to write an offer. So I'm kind of in, including them in the process and letting them know what I'm going to do on my drive back to write up that offer. Right. And I'm, I, and I'm telling them I'm going to call the off the, the agent. So what it does though, is it really in the mind of the listing agent shows what a good communicator you are. The fact that you're even concerned about crafting the best offer you possibly can, not that they're going to influence you and you're going to change your terms. Like you just said, Eric, you already probably are going to offer the same thing, but the communication and finding out what their needs are. And because you may have some flexibility, you might adjust your offer in order to cater to their needs. That goes a long way. I've, I've had more than one agent tell me that they chose our offer in multiple situations because of that phone call. And yeah. so, uh, that, that's kind of like a have to, a have to thing. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's amazing how few agents do that um, on the other side on, on my listings. But And then if you're newer, right, you call Eric or I and say, hey, this is the information I got. You gotta have somebody to collaborate with. That's what I love about our team here. This is what I found out because often you're gonna talk to an agent, especially if you're newer and haven't written a whole ton of offers, you, you may not be able to think of something that hasn't arisen in your world yet, right? So when you talk to Eric, you talk to me, um, we're gonna re maybe remember and connect it to a, a deal or a situation we've been involved with. And you, you, you just might say, oh, I never would have thought of that. So, so that, that's a, a big part of crafting the offer too, is maybe hashing it out and fleshing out the terms with somebody before you write it up and get some uh, other perspective. Yeah, and just keep in mind, everybody wants the same thing. There's four parties involved. You got a listing agent, a buyer's agent, a seller, and a buyer. And they all want the same thing. They want to move to a different location or, or buy the home. So you've got four parties that, are, that would like to work together. But the interesting thing about real estate um, as, a, as a realtor is you don't pick the, the real estate agent you work with. The house picks what real estate agent you work with. So you can't go around and shop for real estate agents and say, that's a good agent. I want to put an offer on that house because I know they'll be easy to work with. It doesn't work that way. We find the house uh, when we're working with the buyer and we get what we get. So the better we can start that communication at the beginning, uh, the better chances you'll have to have it go under contract and the better transaction you're going to have from the beginning. So I just wanted to throw that out there little bit of uh, something that I've, I've done for a long time, but I didn't start out my career doing, but I recommend that everybody do that is talk to the agent, have your buyers write a letter if they're willing to, and it really does help. So we've got, uh, we've got a couple agents on from Oregon. Um, so things are going to look a little different, but I, I'm in my, in our MLS here in, in the Salt Lake board, but uh, even though it's a little different, most of the everything, you know, applies in the same way. So I thought I'd do Jeff uh, tonight is just kind of start going through some of the forms that that I submit when I put an offer in. And if, for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time on the MLS, super easy to get here. It's just under forms. Click on forms and you go to form library. And the zoom bar is always in the way every time. Mm -hmm. 
um, forms library and you'll have this screen pop up on our MLS and you can actually add documents that you want. So if you want to find the REPC, you, you just type in the REPC and then you can find it and then just add it um, over here and then you can create the form. Um, so this is just kind of an example of, of some of the forms that you're going to use. You're not going to use all of these every time, but I thought I'd just run through them a little bit and um, and see if we can uh, create some questions and also some um, help you out a little bit on what we do. So let me see, why isn't it loading, Jeff? Trying to load the packet. Yeah, is it hidden? Oh, it, there uh, we go. it said it was loaded. Okay, perfect. So our real estate purchase contract, I, we've all gone over this a bunch of times, so I'm not gonna walk you through every every piece of it. Um, before we jump into this, uh, I want to make one other point too. Uh, if, you're, if you're working with a mentor like Jeff or Eric or, or myself or a different, a different mentor, the world of technology has kind of helped us out a little bit um, with how we present offers. Because I used to write offers on the hood of a car kitchen table. Um, I don't really do that anymore. Most everything I do is electronic. Um, so what I do is when I have a buyer that says, I love this house, I want to put an offer in on it. I, I say this and I recommend to my buyers to say the same or my mentees to do the same thing. Say, I'm going to run back to my office. I'm going to run some numbers. I'm going to look over the property, find out a little bit of a history, and then I'll call you and let you know kind of my thoughts on on you know the price range and how it's priced and, and maybe where we should work on structuring our offer. So you can do that exact same thing because then we're going to write up the offer and send it over to our buyer for electronic signatures. And the advantage to that is if you're new is right after you say that and you get in the car, call your mentor or call me, call, you know, call Jeff and say, hey, I'm on my way home <laughs> and I'm going to write an offer. Um, help me out what's you know and just let us know what the property is so we can work together to help you write that offer so there's actually a short punch list of those calls right eric it's like you're going to call the agent the listing agent yep. you're going to call hopefully your mentor or another agent that you can kind of talk talk it over with you're you're on your way back to pull comps and to get some more on the history of the property but another one to add to that list that i do even if it's a text message i is my lender um, and that's because of what I brought up before. A lot of clients in that starter price range are at their maximum. So you want to verify payment. They're going to estimate insurance, but you can get the you know principal, interest, tax, and insurance is going to be an estimation. But lenders are pretty good. Uh, have a formula for guessing what that's going to be. Um, I get all that information because now when I get back and after I run those comps and I get some more on the history of the property, when I'm talking to the client, they were we're going over my conversation with the listing agent. We're going over my feedback from the lender where they're at. And sometimes it kills the offer, to be honest. It's like they can't be competitive enough. If they're approved at, say, 375, and this one's listed at 375, and it just got on the market today, and the agent on the phone told me they got six other offers, and they have offers over the list price, I don't want to get my client's hopes up that they're going to win that deal by going in full price, because the agent's already let me know we're not even in the run. So that's another thing I do on that drive back to the office, Eric. Love that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I had another point, but I think I lost it. So we'll, maybe it'll come back. Sorry. In a minute. No, that's all good. So like I said, we're not going to rip through this whole purchase contract because you guys know how to fill them out. And if you don't, then um, um, we can help you out. Um, on an individual basis, but I kind of wanted to go over some important points, Jeff, um, that sometimes agents miss on, on some of these key forms. One is in, in Utah, our, our earnest money is due uh, four calen calendar days um, after we go under contract. And what I, th I think what a lot of agents miss on this is it's actually it's four days, including the uh, day that you go under contract and weekends count um, in that four day uh, space. So if you put a property under contract on Monday, then you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
to get your earnest money turned in either to a brokerage or in most cases it's going to be the title company but if you put a house under contract on wednesday really it's due on friday because if you've got wednesday thursday friday saturday your title company is probably not open on saturday or sunday so you've got to get that in um, by the weekend if you put it under contract on thursday do count the numbers it's due on sunday so that means really it's due tomorrow and if you don't have the earnest money deposited within that time period the contract is actually voidable um, i've personally never seen it happen where a contract is voided because the earnest money wasn't deposited on time but uh, i don't know if you have jeff but it is it is a voidable contract if that earnest money isn't put in at the time. Yeah, it, it basically means you're in default because the, the very first term of the contract that you're agreeing to is to to deposit the earnest money within four calendar days, and your your client's in default by not doing that. So that's your responsibility to stay on top of that, and make sure that get that that happens. So that, I mean, everybody wants to get to the closing table, and like Eric said, don't lean on the fact that we've never heard of it happening before. Don't be the one <laughs> that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not going to go through our whole checklist obviously that that, that uh, we run through because we've done that in other classes and we'll get back to it another time but this is more uh, you know just catching some of those repsy terms I this is really important too. 1.1 all of these items are automatically included unless they are excluded in the contract um, so they keep adding items to this um, 1.1 section and I still think there's a couple things that are missing that I think should be added such as uh, like ring or nest doorbells uh, because they have security systems right here but uh, that's kind of a, a little bit of a gray area I've had people re remove their their nest doorbells and put the old one in on their way out um, without it being in the contract so just keep in mind that these are the items that are that are included. Um, jump in anytime, Jeff, if you want to, if you want to jump in on here, but um, that's an important one. I actually point out to my clients because a lot of times we, we try and get the quick way of filling in the forms. And so we can auto populate from the MLS, right? So a lot of those items that are listed in that paragraph are also check mark items when the agent created the MLS listing. So the, it, it kind of like double inputs them and people will even send in the, the offers and it says see remarks in the included items because <laughs> that's one of the check marks that they can do. I personally, just to show professionalism, I like to clean up my repsy. If I'm inputting the MLS number and it imports all of the included items that they've had, a lot of times it's gonna say um, things that are already on here like um, the range and, or, or the hood or the dishwasher or um, security system, things like that. They'll, they'll list out in the MLS. So now it's kind of a double on there. That's just me personally. I just like to clean it up. It just shows that you've paid attention to detail. Um, when I get a, a, an offer that says see remarks in the included items, which is referring to the listing, of course, it kind of, to me, is a little tell on the thoroughness of that agent. But maybe that's just me. It's just a judgment call I make. I, I like that. Yeah, I like to clean it up as well. Um, I'm just kind of looking for a MLS number here that's active. I could just show what that looks like. Let's see. So we can actually populate these these forms here by putting in the MLS number. Load it up and it'll actually put everything that the listing agent put in and all we have to do and we can actually put our offer date in as well and then also the seller's name which you're going to get from uh, from your tax tax information too so so if we put everything in there and we load that form it's going to put everything in the uh the rep seat and actually all the forms that you have loaded in here so I've got about five forms. It'll populate all of them automatically. So now we got Bob buying this house, this mystery house. And uh, you'll notice that we have other items included and they're actually listed in here. And that's what Jeff was talking about. You clean that up because we actually have 
Um, washer and washer checked here. Sometimes, you know, I mean, it'll pre-populate both. So it's a good thing to, uh, to notice. And if you, one thing that I do just kind of as a side point, if they're not including the refrigerator, if that's not in there and I check that box, I will actually put a note to the other agent and I'll let them know that I did check the refrigerator box. Just kind of a side point, because I don't want them to think that I'm just trying to sneak that through. It's just kind of a courtesy thing, because I don't, uh, I want to help out the other agent too, to make sure that they know. So they don't- and Eric, scroll back down so you can see okay. the, the, what transported from the listing there. See, so for me, I would check washers and dryers and take out the text. Range and range hood and window coverings are up above. Check the microwave. And then that whole line is gone it, because of the check marks on the paragraph. Um, to me, that's what I meant by just kind of cleaning that up. Um, they, they, they already included the washer and dryer, so just check them in the appropriate checkbox there. And window coverings was another big one people write in there, but it's already in there. Yeah, window coverings are included anyway. So, yep. perfect. Um, should we go over this section here, Jeff? Thanks. Um, real, real briefly, um, people kind of get hung up on that. I've noticed with some of my mentees as far as calculating the down payment versus the loan amount and everything. But if you look in that paragraph, it actually says that 2.1C and 2.1E may be adjusted as deemed necessary by the buyer and the lender. So that's not a contract term because um, sometimes they'll say, well, I'd like to put down 10%, but what if I only put five down percent? And it becomes this discussion that's not necessary. So sometimes to even avoid the whole issue, I can even put TBD for to be determined in um, the balance of purchase price in cash at settlement and the loan amount, because we haven't really decided what loan program we're going with yet. But if it's, let's say they're putting down 10%, then obviously, you know, you've got $30,000, you can round that off. It doesn't have to be exact. Um, take their earnest money and then bring in the balance um, at closing. So the, those, those are not something that the, the buyer is going to be held to is kind of my only point. And I only bring that up because it's come up a couple of times just recently with the uh, first offers with some of the new agents. So yeah, let's use your uh, example of what, do you say 10% down? Yeah. Which would be 30% or $30,000. So if they put 3000 earnest money down, they would have a balance of 27,000 at closing and they'd be getting a new loan for 270. Now, if those, like Jeff said, you could put in to, do, to be determined, um, but anything that is added onto an addendum later um, overrides what's in this, in the Rep C anyway. So even if those terms change, what if they decided, you know what, we're not gonna do 10% down, we're gonna do an FHA loan and we're gonna do three and a half percent. We don't go rewrite the contract. That's mm -hmm. just part of the addendum. Yep. Um, this is uh, super important, 2.2, uh, the sale of a buyer's property. This is something that if you're having, uh, if you're working with a seller, obviously um, if they have a house that they have, that they need to sell first and it is subject to their property selling, um, this is going to put you in a situation where your, your offer is going to be less attractive in a seller's market. Um, but it's, it's, part of, it's part of what we do is, uh, you know, we're putting offers in on properties where they already, they're trying to sell the property that they're living in currently. So um, obviously we're gonna check is not if they do not have a house to sell. And one thing on here too, there's not an addendum add-on for this box if you check it. If this check if this is checked in affirmative the terms of the attached subject to sale buyer's property addendum apply so there's a separate addendum just for this uh, one checkbox and we can look over that in a little bit too um any thoughts on that jeff we good yeah, we're good um kind of what going back to what i was saying earlier i always want to make our offer as attractive as possible to the seller, especially in this market when it's seller heavy. Um, so sometimes when I talk to that agent the first time, if they tell me that they need a little bit more time to move out, sometimes I will, instead of doing uh, possession upon recording, I might give them, um, you know, 48 hours or even 72 hours to move out 
after recording um, because it gives them a little bit more breathing room. So if they have two offers and one of them says, we want the house at recording and mine is 72 hours after recording, that seller might say, wow, we can breathe a little bit and we have a little bit more time to get out of our house. It's a little thing, but you just never know what can kind of push, push a seller um, to pick your offer instead of another one. Uh, special assessments, um, HOA, um, you know, kind of depends on the house and the, and the HOA, but um, I usually select seller um, to pay these fees unless we have, unless there's a situation that we don't know about because it's to, I'm protecting my buyer right from the, right from the get go on there just in case there's something on HOA assessments that I'm unaware of. And a lot of times the listing agent will be aware of something and they'll come back and counter if there's something that we need to be aware of. And an assessment might be, um, you know, they're replacing the roof um, and it's going to be a $4,000, you know, per owner in an HOA situation. Maybe they're in a townhome or a condo, something like that. Do you do that different, Jeff? I, I do that exactly the same every time I'm, when I'm making the offer, I'm going to do seller. However, to go with what you were talking about before, finding out how you're going to craft the best offer. If you know that there's an assessment or you know that um, there might be some fees due, uh, you might want to consider that as part of your offer uh, because it becomes a closing cost for your buyer. If, if they can add that in as a closing cost, like I just closed one, um, yesterday and my seller was looking at the, the closing disclosure and we're going through it and he was being charged um, $150 for the HOA fee and he said well wait a minute the HOA fee is $300 how come it's only $150 because the offer he received they had checked split equally between buyer and seller on, on, on that fee that was due it was the uh, uh, reinvestment fee or a transfer fee and so that's something to consider but I don't really do that. Um, it's just another thing that you could, um, as a perk for the, for the seller, if you wanted to be a little bit stronger, it's just going to cost your buyer a little bit more money, but I, I do it this way. Perfect. Excellent. So this is pretty easy. Who's representing who, um, you know, in this case, we're going to have seller, seller, buyer, buyer, um, because I've got my name and my brokerage and the agent's name and their brokerage. Now, if this was, uh, if this was, Jeff Marchin up here with EXP Realty, then we would have to select um, limited agents because we're in the same brokerage. And obviously, if you're re representing both sides, you're going to be a limited agent as well. So pretty basic right there. Um, let's see. The next big item that, we, that I wanted to go over is just... Um, buyer's condition to purchase. This is really interesting because, um, like I said, we're in a seller's market, so it kind of depends on the buyer, but almost always we're gonna have due diligence, the property, purchasing the property is conditioned, or pr purchasing the property is conditioned upon um, due diligence condition. And also the appraisal, if we're gonna have a loan on the property, um, this box is gonna have to be checked because the lender's gonna require it unless there's a, tr a really large down payment and they would do an appraisal wa waiver. But in most cases you're gonna check is and is on both of those items. And this is actually 8.3, this is a little bit newer. They've added this um, probably in the last year where you have to check if financing is required or if it's not required um, with, with the property. So, um, you know, just different situations you could have you know, appraisal is not required. You're saying, I don't want an appraisal, but you still have to have financing. That would be an interesting selection. So just keep in mind that you have to select this box and it usually is going to match um, what you have on the appraisal as well. Um, buyer's right to cancel before financing and appraisal deadline. This is, uh, this is also newer on our um, contract um, where this is an amount of earnest money. You can see, you can see my pre-populated numbers right there, Jeff. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. So if you have $3,000 in earnest money, um, whatever you put in this box, 
the buyer's earnest money shall be released to the seller without requirement of further authorization from the buyer beyond the um, financing and appraisal deadline. So if you are in a very competitive situation, for instance, we've got $3,000 earnest money. If you put $1,500 earnest money in there, that money is going to go hard um, at that deadline regardless. Um, so I usually, in most cases, I'm going to be putting zero in there. Um, but uh, every situation is a little bit different. It depends on how competitive you are. You know, I had one recently where the buyer decided to put half of his earnest money because this, this clause states that after due diligence, so we're still verifying the condition of the property is what he wants, right? So now what it, I guess his gamble is we're, we're pretty secure on the financing end of it. We know he's qualified. So the only variable really is the appraisal. And he's saying, you know what, if it, I, he was willing to let half of his earnest money go hard and we got that deal and it was a multiple offer situation. I don't know if that was the tipping point, but it, it, it was one of many things probably, but uh, he, he elected to do that saying, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to risk that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it is an additional risk. So I don't, I don't love to do it, but I have done it. I, on that, uh, on that letter I just showed you, we actually did half of our earnest money um, at that point on that one because we had we're in a multiple offer situation um 8.4 that's really simple just if you're going to have additional earnest money deposited um i'm usually going to have this is will not um have earnest money and i know that rick likes to not have any blanks so you can put in a zero there um but you know i i think that the earnest money that you're putting down is a reflection of how serious the buyer is so to me, it makes sense to just put your best earnest money up front um, with, to, to have the best possible offer. Um, additional addendums. Um, this is pretty simple. Um, if we're doing FHA property, we're going to have an additional addendum there. Or if we have an ad additional terms, um, we're going to include those in there. Um, Let me make a comment on that, Eric. I mean, this is super important, more, more important than most people realize because Let's say you have an addendum number one that has some terms on there, but you check there are not addenda to this REPSI, but you, you, you submitted one, right? You submitted an addendum with it. However, the REPSI as it stands says there are no addenda. So if it is signed and accepted, you're under contract. It does not incorporate or refer to any additional addendum. That's why we want to refer to the additional addendum because it incorporates it as part of the purchase contract. Okay. Now we all know that, okay, we can check R not and then later an addendum might come that may change additional terms. But what I'm talking about specifically, if they accept the terms of the REPC only, that's a contract. The addenda can only change something, but once you're under contract, is a, a seller obligated to agree to any terms you send them over on an addendum, even including repairs or due diligence items? They're not. They don't have to say yes, you want to negotiate, but they can just say no. Nope. And you got to decide, do we want to move forward or do we want to cancel, right? So, I mean, it's really important to include anything that you're including with your offer, put that, put that in there. What a great point. Yeah, so, I mean, literally that listing agent could ignore your addendum one that says $5,000 of, uh, closing costs to be paid, paid by the seller. If you have that box checked as there are not additional addendum, you send over addendum one asking for closing costs. Well, let me give you a quick example, Eric. I know I mean, we could, we're, we're going a little bit long on this and I mentioned it last week. I think last week you weren't on the call and I'm pretty sure I mentioned it, but some of the people weren't here. Um, I had a buyer, uh, or I'm sorry, a listing agent make this mistake sending me um, a counter offer. And it went, I'll try and be really quick. It went down like this. Um, we were at $540,000. The seller was at $560,000. It was a stalemate. Neither one of them wanted to move. And I spent an entire day texting back and forth with this agent. And he's like, hey, you just get your, your client to come up $10,000 and then you give 5,000 of your earnest money and I'll give 5,000 of my earnest money and my seller will be happy. You know? And I'm like, well, my buyer won't be happy because he's coming up $10,000. And I've never given up $5,000 of my commission for anybody. And um, he's going to probably want the seller to participate on that. So anyway, that was the conversation about the commission reduction. And, and this is why I'm bringing that up. 
after all day going back and forth on this, I literally got a hold of my client and I says, can we just let this go? If you're not going to come up, let's just set it aside. I'm getting tired of talking to this agent. We're at a stalemate. But if you're willing to come up anything, let me know now and I'll send off a counteroffer. And he says, go up $5,000. So I sent a counteroffer for $545. That's all the counteroffer said. Purchase price to be $545,000. The seller accepted it. Along with the listing agent returning that to me, in the email was a commission disbursement authorization reducing my commission by $5,000. Big <laughs> mistake. I feel bad for the guy, but it was not incorporated into the acceptance of that counter offer. So we're under contract. And like I just said, are either party obligated to accept the terms of an addendum once you're already under contract? You already have an agreement. You've got a ratified contract. Any changes are up for negotiation. So sadly enough, in his mind, because my client came up $5,000, he still assumed participation on, on us coming down on the commission. And the funny thing is he hasn't even brought it up yet um, that he hasn't received that back sign. So that's a conversation we're gonna have later, but it's a good example for you guys. Don't make that mistake. If you are going to, uh, what he should have done is counter offered my counter offer and said the terms and conditions of the attached commission disbursement authorization to be incorporated into this, uh, Counter offer. Okay. Well, I'm excited to hear to the end of that story. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's on hold right now because once we went under contract and I was doing my due diligence and I got the PR, there was a notice of non compliance filed against the property for not getting permits for the entire remodel that he did. It was a flip. Yeah, he probably spent a hundred grand or more on this flip. Two brand new kitchens. It's a beautiful home. And he spent a lot of money on it, but the city flagged the house and, and, and put a non-compliance order on there. So that's part of the due diligence is me putting eyes on things like that for my client, right? Sorry, we're getting off topic here, but, but what it, I called the city, that is not an attachment to the person that didn't pull the permit. It's attached to the property. In fact, the non-compliance order, they put the name of the previous owner on it, not the one that did the work. And it doesn't matter because if we close on that property, we now have to deal with the issues of that non-compliance order. And that means we have to file for permits for work we didn't do. That could be very invasive on the property, could cost money, time. Maybe they won't give us an occupancy permit to put tenants in the property. It could be a can of worms. So basically, um, as part of our due diligence, we put it back on them that they are to um, get the certificate of compliance filed against the property before we proceed. So we're kind of in hold on that. Interesting. That sounds like a fun one. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I love the off topic things because that's, that's what we want to talk about. Um, things that are out of the norm that, uh, you know, can help us all out. So fantastic. And, cool. and we've done, we've done lots of to be continued before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. I've got a lot of forms on here. We're not going to hit them all tonight. So <clears throat> oh, that's fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so home warranty. Um, I almost always ask for a home warranty um, when I'm on the buyer's side um, and we use, I use a claimed um, and their best, their best warranty is $500. So the only time that I would ever not ask for a home warranty is if we're in a situation where there's multiple offers and I'm trying to be as competitive as possible and I'll have a discussion with my buyer and say, I always ask for a home warranty and it's gonna cost the seller $500. We can remove that. I still recommend that you get one at settlement. It would just cost you an additional 500 at settlement to have a home warranty moving forward and let your buyer make that decision if they wanna ask for it or not. That's the only, only time that I wouldn't ask for it. And it's really simple. You ask for the home warranty and I always check ordered by the buyer, selected by the buyer, and paid for a settlement by the seller. And then I just dropped my $500 in there. Pretty simple. There was one time I did that in exact reverse because I was moving too quickly. <laughs> Jeff, I have to admit, I did do that. Home check, the seller will order it. Order by it. the seller, selected by the seller, paid for the buyer. 
<laughs> that and cost I, you 500 bucks. <laughs> you know what? The other agent was awesome. And she called me and said, I've never seen this one before. Um, is that what you meant? And I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I did that. I was going too fast. So uh -huh. oh, always pay attention. So she, she actually let me fix that. That was really kind of her. So no, it didn't cost me $500, but yeah. Um, yeah. So Jeff, any, uh, any thoughts on what we're going through right here? No, I, I, I point this out when we're presenting the contract for the client. And I just did this with Chase the other night. Um, it's their responsibility. You're not going to read the contract to them for heaven's sakes. You're, you're, but you do want to point out some things. Like, I like them to know that they get to do that number 11, a pre-settlement walkthrough of the property. It's kind of peace of mind because some, some people are like, what if they bang up the walls? What if they break a window when they're moving out? What if, what if, what if? It's like, well, we're going to go. And, and I've heard of and I've experienced situations where there's been water leaks and there's been things happen um, not by anybody's um, negligence but you know just things happen right before the property records in the other person's name and as you're taking possession you want to make sure it's in this substantially the same uh, condition as it was when they went under contract so I just kind of mention hey you have the right to this um, the seller needs to present it in the same condition as when you went under contract so I don't Which is basically what all of that says. Yeah. In section yep. 12. Any changes in the transaction are going to be in writing. Yep. Yep. And, um, the mediation box, I have heard so many agents and brokers give, give arguments and reasons for both of these, um, and whatever their opinion is, um, mediation is usually, usually about earnest money, um, in most cases, but, I have, I have always selected may at the uh, option of the parties uh, go to mediation because I'm not forcing parties to go to mediation. Um, it just, it just kind of leaves that option open. Well, that's the way I tell my clients too, Eric, as I say, I like to select may and I'm basically kind of just informing them what I suggest they do. <clears throat> I check may because I don't want to eliminate any of your options as the buyer. And I've never been in a situation where broker to broker, we can't work, things out. I've just never had that experience where somebody's wanting to, I mean, I've had people like want, you know, cry and want to, you know, sue or th make threats or this and that. But in the end, we've always worked it out. I mean, professional to professional. So it, for me, it's like, Hey, I don't want to take any of your options away. We can always do mediation, but I don't want to commit you to it up front. That's it. I like that. That's perfect. So, and most likely, if you guys are running into a problem where there's a dispute, you're calling Eric Gray anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, you're getting, getting somebody involved on it as well. So one thing that I point out is just time is of the essence. And I kind of let the buyer know that, um, you know, we want to move as quickly as we can um, on the transaction, um, just out of respect for all parties. Um, but, uh, and the other important part of that clause, Eric, is letting them know that that date down below on section 24, those deadlines, the day it says right here in this paragraph, um, it shall mean 5 PM mountain time on the stated date. So yep. it doesn't mean the calendar date. It doesn't mean midnight it expires when it rolls over the next day. When you have a date, it expires at 5 PM. That's a That's really important thing to bring up. Yes. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, your due diligence deadline is, you know, your first really big deadline that you want to pay attention to. Um, I get, a, I, I've had a lot of questions kind of about the, the seller's disclosures deadline. Um, that's the deadline that the seller has to deliver the um, seller's disclosures to the buyer, um, not necessarily have the buyer return it to the seller. Um, so those need to just be delivered by this date. So if I'm looking at today, September 15th, I usually push this. Um, I just select a week. Um, and then um, just depending on kind of the, it's a little bit long, actually. I like to get it a little bit sooner because it's part of my, um, part of my due diligence too. Uh, but you'll find that some agents don't have the seller's disclosure filled out until they get an offer from the actual yeah, yeah. seller. 
And they're like, I'm going to get it to you as soon as I get it back. And the property has been on the market for three or four weeks. I'm like, okay, well, we'd like to get that as soon as possible because I have, I send the seller's disclosures um, to my inspector. So my inspector knows what the seller has disclosed and I want that inspection ordered as soon as possible. So I need those back when I'm doing my inspection. So when you guys are on the listing side, the point he's making is get those seller property condition disclosures signed when you do your listing agreement and just have them in file. I like to attach them right to the listing so people can see them when they're going to see the property. And on the seller side, if they don't do it by that deadline, wouldn't that mean they're in default again, Eric? Yes, it would. Yeah. So, so if you, you know, if you look at the contract and you look at the remedies of default, what, what is the buyer's remedy if the seller defaults? They can cancel the contract, right? And as liquidated damages, what do they get? They get their earnest money back and an equal amount that they put up for earnest money back from the seller. So some of my clients are savvy and they say, I want to offer more earnest money, especially if they're putting a hefty down payment. Why would you say, oh, I'm going to put $5,000 down, but they're putting $50,000 down on the property. They want it to look substantial enough, but they also realize if the seller defaults, they have to, um, as liquidated damage, compensate them an equal amount that they put up on the table. So Eric, that's one instance and it hardly ever comes up. I don't even know an example of it, but the clause you went over, it says, hey, after appraisal, we may put in more earnest money. Mm -hmm increase our earnest money and we always put zero we don't do that but that would be a i guess a psychological reason why it's like hey i'm i'm confident i'm going to get to the table but what happens if something happens in the life on the seller's end where they can't perform and they're in default um their compensation is going to be dependent on what they put on the line so what a great point because a, se a seller and a listing agent um almost will never look at a large earnest money as a negative or a potential right. negative <clears throat> but there are situations where it could be. I mean, excellent point. So um, your due diligence deadline and financing and appraisal deadline, I would, I would say those are probably just as important or um, more important than even the settlement deadline because those are our deadlines for when our earnest money is hard and those are the most important dates for us to really pay attention to. Those are the dates that are on my calendar clocks go off the day before these dates happen because in 17 years I've never lost earnest money for a buyer that was my fault and I'm not going to start now so um it's our hey, job Eric. to pay attention to those hey, Eric, that reminds me sorry before I forget we were talking about the list of calls or texts you're going to make in your car on the way to your computer to do your due diligence to help them do comps and look at the history. That's another one I do. I always call or text my home inspector. What's the earliest date you have available? Because that's going to help me determine my timelines. If I say we got to be really aggressive on this guys, there's a lot of offers on here. Let's get our due diligence done in seven days. And then I can't even get an inspection order. I'm kind of setting my buyer up to fail. Right. And so if I call somebody and it's like, say a Friday night, and I'm driving home and he says, hey, I actually have an opening Monday. I know I can be super tight on my timelines because I'm, I'll am i even include that in my cover letter to the, to the agent, hope, hoping they choose my offer. By the way, we've already scheduled our inspection for Monday at 9 a.m. Let me know if we need to cancel. <laughs> That'll be part of my presentation of the offer. But the lender, the home inspector, um, the, the listing agent, those are the, you're, you're headed back to write up the offer, right? You've got to gather that information so you can craft the be best offer possible. And another thing you're asking the lender, um, not just on the qualification, if you think your buyer is tight, is what Eric's getting to next, and that's the financing and appraisal deadline. I, I realize that my preferred lenders, um, their workload fluctuates just like ours, right? And sometimes they're super, super busy. And I do not want to set them up to fail either by being too tight on the timelines. And he's like, oh my gosh, why are you doing this to me? There's no way I can get that done. I just get, you know, whatever. So I'll, that's another question or a, te a text or a phone call that says, what do you like for financing and appraisal and settlement deadlines? And relationships with your lenders, guys, are, are super important. And if you don't have one, network with the other agents in the group, find out who they're using and start there. When you find somebody, they do not mind you asking them question after question after question on a deal because they know it's going to make both your jobs smoother and the transaction smoother. 
So that's how I come up with my deadlines on that part, Eric, is I, I, I get my suggestion from the lender. And if that discovery call from the listing agent, they were like, you know what? They just want this done as soon as possible. So then get out of here. I know I want to be as tight as possible and get that thing closed for him. Right. And so when he comes back and says he can close within 21 days or 17 days or whatever, I'm going to be aggressive, but I'm not going to hold him, you know, to that without getting it from him. I love that too, Jeff, because I've started doing that in this seller's market too, is talking to my inspector when I know I'm putting an offer in and saying, what's your schedule? Pencil me in. I'm writing an offer right now. And, okay. and letting that agent know that's huge because in a, in a perfect world, you want to have that inspection at least completed before you ask your buyer to pay for that appraisal. <clears throat> um, sometimes, you know, deadlines are tight and, and you, you know, you're, you're almost doing part of the inspection yourself if you're ordering that appraisal before that inspection is done. But, you know, I like to have that inspection done within 48 hours, 72 hours of going under contract if I can, because I'm just shaving that time right off of, of my, my uh, contract. So I'm, I'm actually ahead. Um, and let's just say, for example, we talk to the, the listing agent and they want to close on October 15th. <clears throat> so we've got September, um, today's date through October 15th. This is not a marathon where you're running 26 miles and you want to just get to the end with just enough energy to finish the race. This is a, this is a three mile sprint and then you can just coast. have, and then you coast the other, whatever, 23 miles. You want to get as much done as you can up front, no matter what your settlement deadline is. So no matter how far out you are, get that inspection done get your due diligence done and, and that way you can have your appraisal. And if there's any hiccups, you're going to be ahead of the game and you've bought yourself some time. And so to that also, Eric, uh, you can see why it would be a good idea to have more than one inspector. We all have our favorites, but I know Eric and I both have one that we really, really like, but he's booked out two to three weeks all the time. Yeah. I can never even get him. I don't even know who would schedule an inspection two weeks out. You know what I mean? <laughs> But we can't we can't get him, and um, so you got to have you got to have uh, contingency plans, and you got to have a couple to, so that you can pull this off for your client. They're they're counting on you, and obviously you're giving them the right to pick their own. But usually they're going to pick from the, the 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 narrowed down list that you work with because if they've never bought a house before, they don't know home inspectors. They need some recommendations, and they can get recommendations from their lender and from their dad or from anybody. Uh, but you're going to have yours, uh, but have more than one. So you're not scrambling. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jeff, we're at the top of the hour. We got through one document. I'm pretty proud of it. But it's perfect because you're on the last page of that document. I know. This is it. Isn't this yeah. the last page, isn't it? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's yep. it. Next <laughs> form, baby. Um, yeah, I think we've covered everything. Um, so even though we're at the top of the hour, um, doesn't mean we're, we're signing off right immediately. I want to make sure if any, anybody's thinking about something or has a comment or a question about what we're talking about, um, unmute yourself and bring it up. I just wanted to talk about the letters Eric talked about. I have done two offers with them and one, I actually, wrote the letter myself after we walked through the house because I was noticing some Hey Jess, Jess, you gotta talk into your mic better. We can't hear you. Oh, okay. Here, I'll put it up. If, it, if I hold it up, is that better? That's better. Okay, sweet. Um, so I walked through a house with a client and we were looking around and I noticed she had a folded American flag and my client's husband was in the Navy and I was like, okay, wait a second. Like, I'm gonna write a letter and just let her know they're in a similar boat like both widows, both had met husbands in the Navy and we were going against three other offers and she picked ours and we didn't even offer full price. And so the letter works. So honestly, like take 10 minutes and do it, post a few picture. Eric made sure that I did it and I was like on it, let's do it. And it seriously was amazing. So that, and it took 10 minutes for me to write up. So if hey, they won't me. do it, you should. You're right, but let me make one 
suggestion or comment if you're on the mm -hmm. uh, let's say you're on the listing site okay yeah um, and somebody sends you a letter do not give your opinion on what mm -hmm. they about that letter read up okay. on fair housing if if you encourage mm -hmm. them to take that um letter because of the cute picture of the kids and the family <laughs> status right <laughs> your status is a protected class right 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 single guy didn't get you just stay right on that they can make their own decision you're not yeah that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the listing agent wasn't super thrilled because he kind of threw a little bit of shade at me that first day. I got a yeah. text and he was like, she took your offer. And that was all it said. Oh, I was well, like, oh, sweet. <laughs> against his suggestion, it sounds Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if that's what happened, but it worked no, that's out. Awesome. Good for you. <laughs> well, well done. I hadn't heard that. that. Great. You know, paying attention while you're in the house and you notice the flag and kind of like that. Pro it sounds like you didn't have the letter before that, right? No, I didn't. I wrote it that night when I submitted the Repsy and the no, offer. That's good. Good observation. Anybody else? DL, I'm going to be really upset if you don't have something. Yeah. Are you here? <laughs> yeah, he's down there. I just scrolled through the attendees, unless he just left his computer on. Maybe you don't have a, a mic or you're in public somewhere, DLs. I'm just, I'm just razzing you. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. It was a great class. Thank you, Sherry. All right, guys. As always, reach out if there's anything that comes up that you need some help with. Of course. Absolutely. Appreciate you all. Thank Thanks. you so much. Good night, you, everyone. Guys. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks.